Welcome to the Zen of Refing Roller Derby Lesson 20, Illegal Contact Penalties, Part 2. I'm Maxis of Stevel, the author of the training manual. I'm filming this on June 6, 2018. The content of this presentation is up to date as of this recording. Should this video become outdated or replaced by a newer version, I'll put a link on the screen to where you can find more information. As always, you can find the latest version of the full training manual at www.tinyearl.com slash zenrefing. A quick disclaimer, the WFTDA, MRDA, and JRDA are not responsible for the content of this training manual or this presentation, nor do they make any claims as to the accuracy of their content. Another note, if you spot any errors or outdated information in this presentation, please put a comment on YouTube explaining the issues and listing the time code. Lesson 20, Illegal Contact Penalties, Part 2. I'm going to split today's lesson into halves. The last lesson, 19, well, full of really, really good stuff, was an hour and 15 minutes, which is kind of long to do all at once. So I'm going to split 20 into two halves. 20A, in which we're going to cover other illegal contact, and 20B, in which we're going to cover multiplayer blocks. And similar to the last lesson, each of those lessons in turn is going to have the first half being sort of like classroom and conceptual training, and the second half looking at like videos. So let's begin with some concepts today. Number one, a skater's direction is determined by the motion of their skates. Now this is opposed to what we said before when we were talking about scoring, which is when we measure passes at the hips. But for purposes, uh, you know, that, that's for determining the skater's location. For determining their motion, we look at the skates. Now this can be a little tricky because a person can be skating derby direction, when they thrust their shoulder out opposite of derby direction, anti-derby direction. And it can even be much more shoulder movement than it was skate movement, so it actually looks like they're blocking clockwise, but actually the skater is moving very slightly in the counterclockwise direction. So in that particular issue, uh, case, it would be a legal hit. This can be a little tricky for referees as they're kind of getting the hang of this, and it's an easy area to go wrong uh, when calling uh, direction-based penalties. Another. As far as direction goes, a block that's initiated while moving perpendicular to the track lines is legal. So uh, it's not clockwise, it's not counterclockwise, and it's not stopped. They're going exactly across the track. Now, I suppose if you got a protractor and a ruler out, you could measure it to figure, oh, nope, they're actually a tenth of a degree off. For the no, 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 we're not, we don't go to that level of detail. Use your eyes, you get one shot at making that judgment. If it looks like they're going across the track, then they're going across the track, in which case it's it's illegal, you know, it's legal in that case. Next, um, to talk a little bit about impact here, just like um, I said this in the last lesson, illegal contact uh, is always a penalty if the block causes. And before I talk about the specific impacts, I want to know for today's lesson, I want you to interpret this a little differently. This is illegal contact while a jam is in progress is always a penalty if the block causes. And this is important because we're gonna talk about some blocking today when a jam is not in progress. And that will use a very different set of thresholds. So while a jam is in progress, an illegal, uh, illegal contact, like an illegal block that makes the target fall down, go out of bounds, out of play, or back into play as we talked about last time. The target to lose their position against the initiator or an initiator's teammate. You know, you block the target aside illegally and your jammer gets through. That's a penalty. Or the initiator or the teammate gaining position on an opponent. Maybe I forearmed you sideways and I don't get past you because of the, the forearm, but I'm able to get past the person next to you in the wall. So that would also be a penalty. And as we said yesterday, or in the last lesson, a brief and minor gain of position does not warrant a penalty unless it earns a pass toward scoring or lead jammer status. So if I forearm you, you stumble a little bit, and I get my hips just for a little instant past you, and then I come right back, and come back, uh, then I come right back, we're just going to say, you know what, I didn't take advantage of that. Yes, I got my hips up there very slightly, but there's no impact on this because I, I yielded that and I let you come back into the position. So or at least gave you the opportunity to come back. Now, if I got a point in the process, now that's an entirely different matter. But if I'm a blocker and it's just I went, doot, doot, you know, past you for just a, just a brief second, then no, we're not going to penalize that. So other illegal contact. Let's start here by talking about the verbal cues. The verbal cue for illegal, illegal contact penalty is illegal contact. And by the way, 
when we talk about illegal contact today, we're not talking about anything referencing a specific target or blocking zone. We're talking basically about a block that was in a time or place or manner which is not allowed, but has nothing to do with a specific part of the body. So illegal contact is the catch-all uh, phrase for most of what we're talking about today. Um, the exception being direction would be the uh, the verbal cue used for things having to do with stopped or clockwise blocks. So they, they, that they've earmarked out for its own little niche. Now, illegal contact can be substituted with the cues illegal assist, early hit, late hit, and out of play block. That would be the two star, the, the, the intermediate cues. Now, those four do not define all possible illegal contact hits. For example, a block, you know, if you are out of bounds and you completely block another player out of bounds, that's an out of bounds block, but that doesn't really cover it in those four cues. So you could say that is an illegal contact hit, that you would be right, or you could also say illegal contact out of bounds block, or illegal contact blocking from out of bounds or something, in which case you're now you're going up to the advanced or the three star cues and you're giving more information. So don't hesitate to, to do that if you see the opportunity arise. For a direction penalty, um, it's either direction, which is the main cue, or stop block. And that's S-T-O-P, not S-T-O-P-P-E-D, which I believe is what it was in the last edition, but that's not the case now. It would be direction or stop block. Stop block uh, would be, of course, a block You know, when the initiator is stopped. We don't say clockwise block anymore, and even though that's a very hard habit for some officials to break, for the simple reason that if you're not saying stop block and you just say direction, then that means clockwise. So, Or the, the person is so rookie, they're just saying direction for both, you know, which is not really wrong. Generally speaking, it's pretty obvious what they're doing. If it's not obvious, then it probably doesn't make much of a distinction. So, All right, now let's talk about the actual types of other illegal contact. First, early hitting. This is initiating a block before the jam start whistle. Now by this, because we have 30 seconds before, or 30 seconds between jams, I do not mean that like one second after the jam ends and you initiate a block. I mean, yes, technically it's 29 seconds before the next jam start whistle, but that's really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like skaters that are coming in lining up for the next jam, you know, uh, and that's, you know, that's more what I'm talking about. This can also include initiating a block before the game start whistle, so it's before the first jam of the game, or initiating a block before the start of the second period of the game. Now, the impact to issue a penalty. Number one, stealing an opponent's starting position. So, like, it's, it's if, if you've got a four wall, and you kind of want to go through them, and you kind of nudge somebody aside for a second, and go through them, and then take a place in your wall ahead of them, that is not a penalty, even though, yes, you kind of nudged them aside a little bit, simply because you didn't steal their position. I mean, you could have gone around, but, you know, you, you went through. But this is not during the game. It's not like the jam is not in place. Relative position doesn't really apply here. That, that, that doesn't really matter. So that's no, 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 uh, no impact. But if you nudge them aside and then you step into their wall between them and the person next to them and then you take a stance there you've kind of stolen their position, or at least inserted yourself into a wall, and you had to use a block to do it. If the skaters were far enough away, you didn't have to have a block, you just went between them, well, that's fine. But if you got to kind of nudge them, block them aside to, to you know, get in there, then that would be uh, high, that would be sufficient impact to issue a penalty. Another one, forcing the opponent to touch an illegal starting position. This could be forcing the opponent down, you know, and I don't mean by touching down, again, I don't mean one hand down on the track, because one hand down is not down. Remember, that takes two. Um, but this could be, you know, forcing them to put both hands down, like you basically knock them down at that point. Could be forcing them to touch out of bounds, and that doesn't have to be much. That could be just, whoop, you know, they just kind of got a step, and their toe step goes out of bounds for just a fraction of a second. Or also stepping um, behind the, uh, behind, you know, uh, like, a blocker stepping behind the jammer line or on the jammer line or a jammer stepping ahead of the jammer line or you know somehow basically into an illegal starting position of what we call basically a false start if the jam was to begin in that instance that's why we consider this sufficient impact to issue a penalty because we don't take into account when the specific jam is starting we're looking at you know if the jam started in that instant that skater would have gotten a false start warning so they had a change of established position from legal starting position to illegal starting position. In theory, 
if that skater was even forced to touch out of bounds, if, if, if in theory you would have like said, oh well, now you're out of bounds, you're not considered in the jam, you'd send him back to the, you know back to the bench, and now we've got players all between jams trying to knock each other out of bounds, hoping the jam will start. That no, this is not what we want. So we would issue a penalty, and we would allow that person to return to the jam. So we are not going to enforce a false start or a skater being out of bounds if it was a block between jams that put the person in that position because uh, we're not going to reward the player who initiated the block uh, for doing so. Another one here. These are s impacts as defined in the rules, but these are not the only impacts that might occur. And some, to some extent, you kind of need to use your judgment uh, as you do any time an unpredictable situation comes up. Here's an example. Uh, you know, jam timer says five seconds, you know, four, three, two, one. One second before jam starts, suddenly the uh, one of the jammers blocks the blocker in front of them. Now, not seriously, but enough that they kind of stumble a little bit. Like they're a little, they're, they're in position, you know, they're kind of down, but they weren't expecting the block right before the jam started. So, you know, they, they, they stumble a bit. Now the whistle blows, and while that jammer is still recovering from their stumble, I'm sorry, while the blocker is recovering from their stumble, the jammer then blocks them again. And because they're a little off balance this time, they can't defend themselves the second time, and they go out of position, and the jammer is able to get through the gap. So the jammer basically was compounding upon what would have been a no impact, um, you know, a no, a no impact early hit, but because they did not allow that impact, you know, that, that what, what little impact, you know, existed, to fully recover before they followed up on that. They gained an advantage. Basically, they threw a pebble down, you know, down the mountain and it turned into an avalanche, allowing that jammer to get through. And that would be another example of an early hit uh, penalty. Um, so, but you're not really gonna find that in the, the rules specifically, but the jammer did gain an advantage because of that initial block. So there comes a point when you have to kind of like look a little bit beyond the written rules and look more into the spirit. The game is not intended to be played between jams. The blocking is intended to occur during a jam. If a block between jams somehow leads into an advantage, even if it has to go beyond that whistle and into the jam itself, then that would warrant a penalty. As I said before, you can issue this penalty prior to the first jam of a game. I have done so. Uh, and, and this leads into another point that you need to consider whether the players have you know, when you're talking about stealing positions or, you know, and such, have they adopted a position or have they not? Because, you know, between jams, sometimes, you know, particularly if there's like a timeout or something like that, the players will kind of come in and they're just all standing in a circle and they're just sort of chit-chatting. They clearly don't have positions, but they're just sort of just kind of chatting for a moment. I would not consider that to that they have taken a position. So if you were to nudge one aside and walk into their circle, I would not issue a penalty for that. I might consider that rude, you know, and, and uh, but I wouldn't issue a penalty for it. However, once the skaters have sort of like gotten into their positions, they're basically grabbing positions for the next jam, and that's kind of clearly where they want to start, or at least at that moment where they're thinking they want to start. And, you know, you can often tell because they'll often get low, like they're starting to guard their position, they're getting ready for the jam. But even if they're standing upright, they have gotten in position and they're kind of owning a position they, they look like they want for the next jam. So I had a game where at the beginning of the game, it's like 25 seconds to jam start or, or till the, you know, the, the, the game starts. And one team went and all four blockers got into position and they got low and they were guarding it. Now they're a little ahead of schedule. It's 25 seconds. They don't have to be low bracing for a hit. But nevertheless, they kind of were. And... In comes a pivot for the second team, and uh, she's skating backwards, and she's talking to her bench, and she's just skating backwards, totally oblivious. I think she's putting her cover on or something, and she just skates backwards right, not not very hard, but right back into one of those blockers who was kind of down holding their position. And it was, wasn't a particularly hard hit, but it was enough the blocker staggered back very slightly, and they put a foot behind the jammer line. So I looked at that for a second, and I issued an early hitting penalty to the pivot for initiating this hit. And the pivot turned around and looked at me like, really? I was like, really? Because that jammer had grabbed their position. Had the jam had the game started at that specific instant, you know, they would have started in a false start. So I issued the penalty. Again, had that blocker been just standing up and just not really holding a position, but just sort of just chit-chatting with their friends and was clearly not owning a position on the track, then I would not have issued it. Similar to early hitting, we have late hitting. Late hitting is initiating or continuing a block after the fourth jam call-off whistle. 
Now remember, we have three sets, you know, you know, tweet, 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 tweet. So we're talking after the fourth whistle of the first set. They've got to the end of that fourth whistle to finish their blocks. You know, after that, I want them to immediately stop that block, you know, uh, because if they continue it, you know, intentionally or not, but if they're continuing that block or initiating a new hit after that point, um, then I'm not going, uh, you know, then they're engaging in an illegal action. Now, you can keep in mind that, like, a take a jammer. A jammer's running, a jammer's about to do an apex jump, and just as they're, they're launching for the apex jump, the jam call-off whistle goes off from the other jammer. So while they're in the air, there's tweet, 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 and then they land, you know, and as they're landing, they make contact with an opponent, you know. Like, they've, they've landed it, so it wasn't an airborne hit, but... This jammer cannot avoid that while they're in the air. Even though the four call-off whistles went where they're in the air, it's not like they can stop. So the block itself was sort of initiated as they launched, you know, like, uh, or at least they were committed. They weren't going to be able to stop. They, they have to immediately cease blocking, or at least that would be my way of putting it. They are unable to do so, you know. Um, but if a, uh, yeah, if the person goes and it's like they launch after you know the fourth whistle and then they hit somebody or they land and then they turn into somebody you know then i'm going to take it more seriously um the impact for this uh would be forcing an opponent down or significantly off balance notice the word significantly it doesn't mean the little minor stumble isn't going to count but it doesn't have to be like they're staggering around waving their hands in the air like severely off balance but significantly you know they there's no mathematical metric here. You'll know it when you see it. Were they significantly off balance? If so, that's a penalty. Forcing an opponent down, you know, obviously matters because forcing an opponent down is basically an extreme off balance. They couldn't stand anymore. They went down. But notice there's no out of bounds, out of play, gaining position, anything like that because the jam has ended. We don't really care if they're out of bounds. These are skaters that are finishing the prior jam, so it's not like they're losing their position on the track, you know, uh, for the next jam. And it doesn't really matter if somebody goes past anybody. They can't get points for it anyway at this point. And it doesn't matter if they go out of play or not because the engagement zone ceased to exist when the jam ended. Blocking to or from out of play. This would be initiating a block while out of play or against an out of play target. Now the exceptions here, as we've said in several lessons, jammer on jammer blocking is legal anywhere on the track. Also, counter blocking while out of play is legal even though the blocking itself is illegal. So if, you know, two blockers are out of play and one initiates, you know, they, they turn and they're going, you know, into the other one, the other one can turn and make a motion back to the first just to counter that block coming in. The first one is engaging in an illegal action. The second one is engaging in a legal action. There's no special notes here on impact just because it's the same standard impact that I described at the beginning of the lesson. The falling, going out of bounds, back into play, losing position, blah, 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 blah. Now, something to just keep in mind, that's commonly referred to, and, and maybe I should have said this in an earlier lesson, it's it's commonly referred to as high impact, or at least some referees will call it impact, high impact. So if somebody says it was a block with high impact, that means it was a block that went down, out of bounds, you know, like that. They're just basically abbreviating it by saying high impact, so we don't constantly have to re... Uh, restate the possible impact. So I might say, you know, if you block from out of play, you know, if you block out of play and you force the opponent down with high impact, it's a penalty. That's just so I don't have to say, if you block from out of play, you know, then if you knock them down and out of bounds or out of play or back into play, blah, 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 it's just, you know, it's much faster to say with high impact. So high impact is what we're looking for in terms of an out of play block. Next, blocking will stopped or moving clockwise. This is simple, initiating or maintaining a block while stopped or moving clockwise. This is actually a little trickier um, to figure out than it sounds. First off, high impact will certainly apply as penalties. You knock the opponent down, out of bounds, blah, 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 that's all a penalty. And that's a lot of what clockwise blocks are. You know, so skaters going clockwise, they hit into, you know, they, they, they make contact with the opponent, the opponent falls down or goes out of bounds or something. That's a penalty. A more subtle version of this is this another impact which is severely changing an opponent's speed or trajectory and severely is an interesting word that the rule uses because one mile an hour to zero may not seem like it's severely changing their speed but in a sense it is in that it was a hundred percent drop in speed they were moving now they're not so you need to use a little judgment in this because 
The rules of create a specific exception. If the initiator immediately ceases the block or resumes counterclockwise movement, then we're not going to issue the penalty. Okay, what does this all mean here to do with speed and trajectory? Okay, consider this. Two blockers are leaning against each other, kind of like torso to torso. And let's say this is the jammer trying to get through. The jammer is pushing counterclockwise, pushing, pushing, derby direction, derby direction. And they, they are making progress. They are, have a speed. It's not very fast, maybe half a mile an hour, but they are, you know. As a matter of fact, by the way, it can be like an inch per second. As long as we see that skater, you know, in front there, as long as we see those skates continuing to move, even very slightly, we're going to consider that counterclockwise movement and thus not a stop block. But now if that front person digs in their toe stops and that, that counterclockwise movement stops, now we want that initiator, who's the person digging in their toe stops in front, to immediately cease that stop block or resume counterclockwise movement. They can cease it by just going, whoop, you know, and backing out of the way. They Or they can, you know, stop digging in the toe stops so that pushing continues them moving forward again. If they do not do that, if they do not cease the block, and they continue holding that person in place, then we're going to issue a stop block penalty in that case. Or similarly, you know, they're moving in that slight counterclockwise direction. They dig in their toe stops and they're pushing back. So they momentarily pull the person to a stop and then they start moving counterclockwise. Or I'm sorry, they start moving clockwise. Again, we're going to issue a, uh, issue a penalty at that point because they have maintained this block, maintained the application of force in the clockwise direction, that, that severely changed the opponent's speed. They were making very slight, you know, counterclockwise progress, and now they're actually making negative counterclockwise progress. It's like negative speed. They're going clockwise again. So we're going to issue a penalty for that. This can be a little tricky sometimes to determine, particularly on the stop blocks, because sometimes jammers get frustrated, and they basically stop pushing. So that person digs in their toe stops for a second and the jammer just stops pushing. They're just leaning against the person, but they're no longer pushing. So the toe stops aren't, aren't what's holding it. They're just sort of like leaning against each other a little bit at this point. And they stop. And it can look, by the way they, by the way they are, that they're actually applying force against each other, even though they're actually applying very, very little force. It's more just from leaning against each other. So I don't have a specific trick or technique for telling when it's one situation versus the other, but look for it. And again, when I said the initiator, if they immediately ceased that block or resumed counterclockwise movement, it's not a penalty. Immediately, as, to, as always, is defined at the first legal opportunity. So if that skater has no opportunity, for example, they're surrounded by a big crowd of people and they're stuck and they can't move. This can sometimes happen at jam start, you know, where the wall in back, you know, is it's a stop block technically because that jammer is not making any progress. But that person in back can't move because there's too many skaters right in front of them. And they're, nobody in front is deliberately trying to hold them back. It's just everybody's just sort of crowded and everybody's stuck. So in that case, we're going to say the initiator does not have the opportunity to cease their block or resume counterclockwise movement. So we're not going to penalize them yet. We're going to wait till they have that opportunity. Then we're going to look for it. Next, let's talk about illegal assists. Illegal assists are assisting while down, out of play, stopped, skating clockwise, or fully out of bounds. This includes active assists while straddling, and we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about assists, uh, and it, it, there's an entire lesson on this later, so I don't want to go into a lot of detail here, and we'll save our videos on assists for later, But um, if I can find any. But the an active assist is this. Basically, when you reach out and you pull someone with your hand, you are taking an active role in that assist. So that you, can, you, you cannot do while you are straddling, but you can do a passive assist while you're straddling. A passive assist means you're just sort of a body there. You didn't actually do anything. Like a skater comes by, grabs onto you and pulls, you know, a teammate pulls onto you and gets past you. So all you did was just stand there. They grabbed you. They did all the work. So you're only the passive participant. So again, assisting will down, out of play, stop skating clockwise or fully out of bounds is always illegal, active or passive. For straddling, active assists are illegal. Passive assists are legal. What is sufficient impact to issue an illegal assist penalty? Causing a chained, uh, change of relative position. In other words, somebody gets past you. You know, they're helping a teammate get past you, or the teammate got past you because of an illegal assist. That would warrant a penalty. Um, and something a little, a little keep in mind here. 
technically speaking, if you are stopped and you take a downed skater, give them a hand and you help them stand back up, technically speaking, that is an illegal assist. You were stopped, you helped a downed skater, you helped them upright. So they have gained position as a result of this. Even they're in back of you, they gain position from down to upright. And upright is a much better place to be on the track. But we're not going to penalize for that particular case. We're going to consider that good sportsmanship. It's just like if you were to help an opponent stand up, you know, we're not going to call that some sort of bizarre forearm action because you impacted their position. Or no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's good sportsmanship. We want that. All right. And again, we're going to talk about illegal assists more in another lesson later on in the program. So let's talk a little bit about other types of illegal contact. And these are ones that do not have a specific verbal cue. This would be blocking to or blocking from out of bounds. This, these are all high impact penalties, but they're going to use, we're, we're looking at three specific types of out of bounds blocking. Number one, initiating a block against a fully out of bounds opponent. So that would be skaters totally out of bounds and you go, nah, boom, you take them out like that. It could also be something a little more simple about like your, uh, your inbounds, they're out of, fully out of bounds, but right next to you and you just give them a little shoulder block or something like that, and they fall down or have to veer way off, and it significantly delays the return to the track. Some sort of like major impact there. That would not be allowed. Initiating or continuing a block while out of bounds, including straddling. Um, so straddling is sort of the worst of both worlds. You can get hit, but you cannot initiate a hit. So you really... <laughs> so. If you are straddling on the track or fully out of bounds, you may not initiate a hit. Similarly, if you're in bounds and you're, you know, blocking somebody and then your skate touches, you know, beyond the line, so now you're straddling, you have to cease that block. You may not continue that block. So, uh, so again, we're, we're, this can get a little tricky because you'll notice sometimes that you'll see this where a skater is on the track and they push an opponent you know, onto the line. You know, this opponent is pushing back, trying to keep their position, but they push them so this uh, the target is now straddling the line. So now this ta the target has to stop pushing back because they cannot be counter-blocking. They cannot be, you know, trying to put force to counter this. But sometimes they'll do it anyway, and you'll sit and you'll watch this, and you'll, be, you know, like, okay, we've got the who, you know, we, we know that this skater is, you know, is, uh, you know, is, is, is counter-blocking. We've got the what, they are counter blocking while out of bounds, that is not legal, that they're continuing this block, but we don't have the impact yet, and so we have to wait. And sometimes the block will just naturally cease on its own, the, you know, the, the other person will just get bored and skate off to somewhere else, or this person, maybe they'll go fully out of bounds and then the block will cease, but sometimes they push their way back onto the track. Now that's a penalty because that's, remember, high impact, you know, like knocking a skater out of bounds or gaining position. Well, this person didn't, the block that pushed them out of bounds was legal, but when they counter blocked back, they gained a position. They got back on the track. That is a significant gain of position, and therefore that would be a penalty. Finally, picking up speed for a block from out of bounds, even if the contact takes place once fully in bounds. So again, we don't want skaters being out of bounds and suddenly just making a beeline for somebody right on the track, just bolting right, you know, and they're accelerating. Yes, if they're stopped out of bounds, they have to accelerate just to get back on the track. But we want them to get on the track, take a beat to establish their position, then they can go initiate a block. They cannot just go near with this huge initiation that started from out of bounds and nail somebody on the track. And again, for all of this, we're looking for impact here uh, that deters their, uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, either high impact or in some rare cases can delay their return to the track. For example, you block a fully out of bounds skater, you don't knock them down, but you knock them like way out of their trajectory and they gotta go loop around the middle for a minute, maybe avoiding officials before they can come back. That I would consider high impact as well because that skater might have been able to get back from the track in one second otherwise, but now it takes them four seconds to get back from the track. So that would be, high imp uh, that would be a, an impact as well. I want, to talk, uh, I want to mention blocking well down. You're not supposed to do that. If you're down, you're supposed to be falling small or at least staying out of everybody's way, not initiating blocks to the hips of skaters next to you. So even if the block would be otherwise legal if you were upright, which, okay, shoulder to hip is hard to do, but in theory it's legal. But if you're down, you can't do it. So if you're blocking well down and that block has impact, that is a penalty. 
Uh, similarly, blocking a downed skater. No, 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 no. We don't like this. Now, mind you, the impact here is a little funny. It's not just high impact, because how do you knock, block a downed skater down? They're already down. You can't really block them out of bounds too well. I mean, in theory, you could, because maybe they're right by the line and they have to you know, lean down and brace themselves and the, both of their hands or something go out of bounds. But remember, one hand out of bounds is not out of bounds. So even if they're by the line, there's chances there's going to be one hand that's going to catch them and allow them to brace themselves because they're down. So what the impact we're really looking for is did they delay their return to the track? So, you know, that skater is wants to return to the track. So if a blocker, for example, is stumbling next to a downed, a downed opponent and they reach out and they brace themselves on that opponent in doing so, they kind of shove them back down or prevent them from returning to the track. That is impact. That would be a penalty. And finally, blocking while airborne. Now, the rules are somewhat contradictory on whether this is illegal contact or if this is misconduct. The rules say this is a form of illegal contact, but the casebook puts all the scenarios for this in the misconduct section. This is something they'll probably have to kind of clean up in future rules editions, but for now, it's, it's good enough to realize that if you call this as illegal contact or misconduct, you're not going to be wrong. You can argue it either way. So... The impact that you're looking for here, of, of course, would be things like high impact, you know, knock him down, out of bounds, blah, 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 all that would count. But aside from that, forcing the opponent out of their established position. This is a little unusual here. And by established position, I don't just mean change of status of down, to, you know, up to down, in down to bounds, because we already mentioned all that. What I mean is like, you got a four wall, uh, you know, like of blockers, and for some reason you do an, a you know, Jammer does an apex jump, maybe they pass their own, uh, you know, team or something like that, and they land, and they hit one of these, uh, you know, blockers, or, or I'm sorry, they don't land because they're airborne. They basically hit a blocker on the shoulder enough that that shoulder goes way for, you know, like out of their position in their wall. Even though it may not, you know, uh, the, the block may not have what allowed the jammer to, say, land in bounds and gain position, or maybe the jammer even fell down. They never gained position. But the fact that they sent that person out of their wall we're going to issue a penalty on. This is a looser metric than normal in the game. Normally, we want a change of position or, you know, to see that person go down or out of bounds or something. But in this particular case, we're going to say just forcing that person out of their wall, that's enough. And the reason we're going to do that is because blocking while airborne is inherently dangerous. We want to discourage this. Now, this is not to say that all physical contact initiated while that person is airborne is going to be a penalty because you know, if there's a little light contact, just shoulder to shoulder rubs, and that doesn't really have much of an effect, then we're not going to issue the penalty for it. We're just going to consider that no impact. But yeah, if they're jumping and they're shoulder to shoulder, and that causes the, uh, the target to stagger forward and get out of their wall, we're going to issue a penalty for that. And again, I want to reiterate what we said in one of the earlier lessons here. Blocking an airborne skater is legal, provided the manner you're doing it, you know, like you're inbounds, upright, using a legal blocking zone against a legal target zone, blah, blah, blah. Provided you're, you're doing all that, it's legal. So, you know, it, it's basically we're setting a higher metric for the person who's in the air because if you've ever been, like, jumped on by a little kid, you know, who just runs up to you and says, you know, oh, Uncle Ant or whatever, you know, and they just leap on you, even at 50 pounds, they'll send you staggering back, you know. So you really don't want a high-speed adult roller skater f zooming at you and then jumping, you know, uh, jumping and making contact with you when they're jumping because it doesn't take much to really send you staggering. All right, let's look at some footage, folks. All right, first up, late hitting. <laughs> All right, that was pretty fast there. Let's take a look again. Okay, jammer coming in. Listen for the whistle, then watch when the hit takes place. Black. There we go. Yep. We basically hear the whistle probably right around here. And, you know, the blocker has plenty of time not to engage. They choose to engage. It causes the jammer to fall down. The out of bounds doesn't matter. Remember, there's no out of bounds when the jam's off. But. Black. Two, three, two, zero. Misconduct. There we go. These days we'd call it as illegal conduct, but in the old day, I'm sorry, illegal contact, but in the old days, it was considered misconduct. That is a late hit. And by the way, there's a little lesson to be said here. That it's very important for referees to blow the jam call-off whistle. If you notice, you heard the whistles, but you didn't hear mine, because mine's much louder. The reason being is, if I recall correctly, I was head referee in this game. 
and I'm only using a finger whistle, and it takes me a little bit to get the whistle up to my mouth, and I don't always get the jam called off. It's entirely possible that had I gotten that whistle, you know, had I done the call-off whistles, that that jammer would have been, I'm sorry, the blocker would have been a little more aware and might not have made the hit. So it's good to do this. Right, let's take a look at another one here. Oops, there we go. These things keep starting up. Okay. This is kind of a short clip. Now watch this. Jam gets called off. Now watch. And that whistle calls the end of the jam. There we go. See, boom. Not worried about the hit right at the very start up there, you know, towards the, uh, yeah, like right the one you're seeing right there. But the subsequent hits that occurred now that that skater is going clockwise, and they're sitting there engaging. I mean, they're really engaging at that point. She has, like, totally been in the zone. And again, by the way, my whistle, I didn't blow the jam call off whistle, so maybe I inadvertently helped lead to this, but she's totally in the zone. She's going back after there. Now, notice the skater is bracing for the hit. She sees, uh, the, the blue blocker sees that black blocker is still really into this. So she's bracing. She takes a little hit. And she's bracing again, and he goes in for the second hit, and the second one knocks her down. So in this case, definitely a late hit penalty, you know, just as it was in the first clip. Um, and this is starting to get towards egregious, but it really wasn't, uh, just simply because she was braced for the hit. She was, you know, she, she saw it was coming. There was no, you know, high safety, uh, you know, high level of safety danger here. But, you know, had she gone in and totally floored her because the skater, you know, honestly thought the jam was over and wasn't expecting it, that would be getting towards expulsion level, so. And that whistle calls the end of the jam. There we go. And by the way, another little lesson in there. Although we call off the jam, whist uh, call off the jam with three sets of whistles, if you have skaters continuing to play, you can absolutely add more whistles into it. You know, so three sets is just a minimum. If you need to do more, do it. All right, now let's take a look at clip number three. This is an out-of-play block, so let's watch here. Okay, this is going to get really loud in my ears, so I'm going to turn that down a little bit. Okay. There we go. All right, we've got a no-pack situation. Watch what happens when the no-pack occurs. You, can, you can't really hear the whoever was wearing the helmet cam here doing it, but you can see the referee on the outside doing no-pack and calling it. So we've got no-pack. And that orange blocker engages. I'll even go through it here. Watch for the hand signals in the back. And there goes the no-pack hand signal. See, she's, she's signaling back. And now orange blocker is engaging. Knocks down Black Jammer. That's an out-of-play block. Something to keep in mind, too. An out-of-play block, unlike a failure to reform, which we'll talk about more later, does uh, not need uh, to have a warning given before you issue it. A failure to reform is just sort of like, you know, the skater is doing something instead of reforming. Initiating a block would certainly count. But an out-of-play block is a much higher level of impact. I mean, she's not supposed to be blocking at all, and she's not only blocking, she forced down that jammer. That's a very high level of impact on the game. So even had that referee in back not held up the no-pack you know, symbol, we would have issued the penalty. An out-of-play block penalty does not require a warning. So anyway, very good call there. Now let's take a look at this. Out of play! Ah, there we go. Pack is front! Out of play in the back! Boom. All right, you're hearing my lovely screeching voice so when my voice goes. Okay, so let's watch this again. We got the whole pack here. Okay, there are a few people kind of straggling in back. She knocks her out of bounds, but that's fine because, you know, look, we've got the pack in front and we've got 10-foot links. And if they're not in the pack in back, then they're certainly in play. But it looks certainly looks like they're in the pack. I can see four of them and, you know, there's more not too far up ahead. So, So that's fine. Legal hit. Blocked, you know, white jammer out of bounds. Pack is front, out of play back. in the back! But right after I call that out of play in the back, boom, there goes the pivot in and blocks white jammer out of bounds. That's high impact. That warrants a, warrants a penalty. I, and again, I didn't even have to issue the warning for that to be considered an out of play block. Out of play block calls do not need a warning, but they have to cause high impact, in this case, knocking the skater down out of, or out of bounds. So. All right, let's take a look at number five. Now we're into clockwise blocks. 
There we go. That's going to get loud in my ear. I'm going to have to remember that. Okay. Pink 4-4, four, four, clockwise block. All right. So did Pink 4-4 four, four commit a clockwise block? Was this a good call? Let's watch. Well, certainly somebody went down. Let's take a look here. All right. So we got all... Oops, there we go. Okay, we got the blockers all moving. Everybody's going. So far, so good. Watch the pivot. Pivot is sliding backwards and engages blue four. Blue four is knocked off balance. And blue four is actually the one that knocks their teammate. Now, something to keep in mind. Back in the day, remember, severely off balance was considered a, an acceptable uh, metric for issuing the penalty. And certainly, that looks pretty severely off balance. I mean, she's barely holding on in there. You know, so she managed to stay up, but not by much. Maybe even blocking her own skaters would allow her to stay up. But these days, it's a se severe change of sp uh, speed or trajectory. And it doesn't seem to have changed all that much. Let's take a look. See, there's the out-of-play block. Or, I'm sorry, there's the clockwise block. But it didn't really kind of... Like, nowadays, I don't think I'd have issued the penalty for it. And the fact that she managed to take it her own teammate, well, that's just kind of a bummer. Plus, whatever, you know, the pink blocker in the back with the white helmet might have had something to do with the teammate going down as well. She, There's definitely some engaging going on there. Matter of fact, you know, it's looking like that blue blocker may not have even touched her teammate. Or maybe if it was, it was a little skate on skate or something. But, yeah, I think there might not have even been the blocker, the, the jammer taking down the blocker. So, so anyway, yeah, I, I don't think that uh, nowadays I would issue a penalty for... I think I would call that no call on uh, pink pivot for the clockwise block. Let's take a look at this. Okay. Here we go. Watch for a clockwise block here. Boom. Was this a clockwise block, folks? Let's take a look. There goes gray. Clockwise black blocker falls down. Again, was this a clockwise block? Let's take a look. All right, gray blocker is beginning to move clockwise. She's zooming. There she goes. But look what that other blocker is doing. She is deliberately trying to move into her way. And boom, she slides right in the way. And black blocker falls for it. You know, notice too that gray blocker, she's what, like three feet inbounds right now? Something like that. She's kind of inbounds a ways. But by the time she gets back, look how close to the line she's getting, you know. She's trying to avoid this hit. She's making it, you know, a good faith effort to avoid it, but also Black Blocker is clearly the initiator. So Black Blocker has initiated, and that's the legal initiation. Anything, maybe even Black Blocker is moving a little clockwise there, but it doesn't matter. Black Blocker takes herself down. It's no impact on Gray Blocker, so I'm not going to issue a penalty for this one. I think that was, that was a good no call. All right, now let's take a look at this one here. Watch blue five here, buddy. All right. What happened? Blue five is being forced derby direction, and she stops and really pushes her way back. I'll run this in slow motion. See, there she goes. She's going in derby direction. She's digging those toe stops in, though. She eventually manages to stop and begins moving clockwise and pushes that jammer right out. That's the penalty. So, yes, this is a good clockwise block call on blue five. Number eight. Let's take a look here. Ah, loud in my ear again. Okay. All in. Black what happened two, four, there? Clockwise. All right. Did black two, four commit a clockwise? Well, let's see. She's kind of pushing sort of clockwisey there. And the jammer went past. So let's take a look. Here comes black 2-4. There comes the pivot. Skating in clockwise. She's kind of kind of stopping there, sort of. But she's continuing to move clockwise. Not a lot, but a little bit. But you don't have to move a lot. It's kind of somewhat perpendicular, but, you know. So a referee could make the argument that the clockwise motion has ceased and it's turned into perpendicular. I'm thinking it's still a little clockwise. And look what happened for the effort. She cleared that blocker right out of the way and allowed the jammer to pass. So the jammer, boom, is picking up a point on that, on both those red blockers in back. And she goes out. So yeah, 
That's clockwise block because the clockwise block allowed the jammer to gain position, thus gaining points. That's a significant impact. All right, here's a good one, folks. You're going to love this. Blue 2-2-1! <laughs> I promptly run in there, by the way, and issue it to Blue 2-2-1, two, two, so I don't know what I was thinking. But obviously, selecting colors in the heat of the moment, not my strong point. So what happens? Okay. Look at that. She's stopped. She's stopped. She's stopped. Now here comes this referee. There's, By the way, there's always a referee in your way at the good moments. And there she's up on the toe stops, and boom, and she's taken a step. And she knocked that person flat over. Plus, look at that arm. She's got that arm ready to go. I can't really see, but it sure looks like she pushed that arm out. And she flattened her. So, this, I think we've got a slower version after. Blue, two, two, one! Then, nope, I don't have a slower version. But yeah, this one, by the way, I expelled her on the spot from the game. I called this an egregious stop block. Clock, I think I called it a stop block, but either works. It was e egregious direction block. Boom. Blue, two, two, one. That skater is not moving at all. See, I started to issue the penalty, stopped because I realized that uh, that uh, jam was not moving, called off the jam. So, then the medics were already headed over, or at least I knew they were going to come over. They saw that jam get called over. Notice, by the way, the referee's already down on his knee. They, we know the game. So, yeah. Um, something, so yes, I expelled her. I did not even confer with my crew on this one. Normally I would in the case of an expulsion, but I had such a front and center view on this, I was convinced it was an egregious thing. And being the head referee, I chose to expel her for this. So, and uh, by the way, notice that skater as she falls. She's going down. There goes the jammer. She's flailing her arms out behind her. And then, boom, the head goes down anyway. She hits her head. This is when you don't want to move a skater. You keep her right there until the medics can come over. Because because that skater, you know, the expulsion can wait. The, that skater is potentially got a head or neck injury, a concussion. We want those medics to get over. We took a very nice time out at this point for the medics to attend to her. All right, let's go on to number 10. Ooh, okay, here we go. This one is an ink blot. This is a Rorschach ink blot. I want you to be the judge. Green! Now, I obviously issued the penalty. You can hear me starting to yell green. And that is loud in my ear. Okay. Here it is again. So let's take a look at this. Okay. We've got green blocker. Definitely going clockwise. She's not aiming for that blocker who, who's now, who's currently, look at, she's, si she's sidestepping. She's trying to get in the way of green blocker. Green blocker, by the way, is drawing a cut. That's why they don't want uh, her moving clockwise. So she jukes inward, and then that, then that, uh, is that a black pivot? Is that a black blocker? I can't, I guess that's a black blocker. And she's turning in. She's definitely trying to intercept her. So that black blocker, whatever happens to her right now, she is totally the initiator because green blocker is making a very good faith effort to avoid her, and she's doing everything she can to get in the way of green blocker to prevent her from going back. But she gets by. That, she's not the one that falls down. Oh. No, I take that back. She did fall down. Well, it's her own damn fault she fell down because she inter she uh, was deliberately trying to intercept her. But now there's a second one, too. Watch the black blocker, smaller one right here. Let's see what she does. She's standing in place. Fine, fine, fine. But then look, now she's starting to move over a little bit. See, she's sliding. Look at, look, look at those skates in back sliding into the way. She's also trying to intercept green blocker. So now she is initiating as well. Now the catch being is that, again, just because somebody's initiating your way, or in that in, in green blocker's way, doesn't make the, the black blocker the initiator if green blocker can stop, you know, or can avoid the hit. Well, in the first one, green blocker made a good faith effort to change directions and avoid her. But the second one, that's a little trickier. The catch is that her, there's clearly some leg contact. See, their thighs are hitting, and so she's off balance a little bit trying to get around. So I don't view her as being able to prevent her from initiating the block on this other skater. I think she was kind of stuck into it. Let's take a look at full speed again. Green! Yeah, so I, I think that in retrospect, I should not have issued the call. I think this should have been a no call on both parts, but other referees might view it somewhat differently as they watch. Let's take a look. 
<laughs> Green! Yeah. She's definitely taking a little step or two, but right now she's off balance a little bit. So I'm not going to fault her for basically she's going from one skater initiating into her, knocking her off balance, to another skater initiating into her. I don't think she's try intentionally trying to get uh, you know, to hit either. I think she's trying to make a good faith effort to get through, and she wasn't able to do it because the other skaters got in both ways. So the second block, the first one, obviously, black blocker's own damn fault. She goes down. The second one, black blocker initiates into green blocker, and they both fall down. That was black blocker was initiating, so it's not a clockwise block on green blocker's part, and black blocker initiated and successfully took green blocker down. Now, the one thing I would say is Black Blocker, let's watch her skate. She's like foot, two feet in front of that in front of that uh, that line right now. And let's see what happens. Look where she is now. She's two feet in back of it now. So actually, had I really been on my A game, and I wasn't clearly here, I think I would have issued that Black Blocker, the, uh, the clockwise block penalty. Because she, the second Black Blocker, moved clockwise into Green Blocker, and forced her down. And that would have been a great call, by the way, for an OPR to get over there, So because they would have been watching like that. And by the way, bonus points if you noticed, two things. Number one, in back, we've got a door open. Those are not supposed to be open during a jam in progress. Number two, you might also notice that we have a coach standing out here in the lane. When this video was taken, uh, that was more commonplace. Risk management guidelines have since clarified that only skaters involved in a jam and officials are allowed to be in the safety lane. So, uh, yeah, they would not be there. I, th I think that was actually like 11 feet. So I think there's a, like a little faint line. I don't know if you can see it at home, like right in the part of the person or something. But I ref at this uh, venue regularly, and I know that we would no longer allow him to stand there. But maybe in this maybe in this day we offset the track or something, and it was allowed. Anyway. <laughs> Great! Let me tell you. Had I called Black Blocker on that, I would be so feeling I nailed that. I would have been patting myself on the back. All right, let's take a look at some stop blocks. Oh, loud in my ear. I will never learn. Okay, let's try this again. Now, this is Jam Start, so let's watch. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was quite the little block, wasn't it, there? Jam Start. You know, the tweet goes off, and suddenly, boom, knocks her down. Remember, those wheels, you know, or those skates, need to be moving either perpendicular to the track or counterclockwise, derby direction. And they are not, you know, there's a slight little, you know, like as she goes to, that's even prior. She's just rebalancing herself as the jam starts. And then, boom, she just goes right in and floors her. So we'll watch that again. But yeah, that's a very good stop block. Stop block. Let's take a look at another one. Yeah, boy, that was fast. Okay, watch this. Right at jam start. Listen for that jam start whistle, and watch what Green Green Jammer does. Yep, yeah, it's the same sort of thing. So let's take a look at her feet. Because remember, that's what we care about is the skates. Not much. I mean, there there is a little bit of movement on the right one, but let's take a look. Let's see if we can see this in the moment. Yeah, she was already making contact, really. See, she's leaning in, and then the, that skate is kind of moving. This is not her, like, taking a step or something. Had she been one step over to her right, and then she stepped and initiated then I would say that's allowed, but I'm not liking what I'm seeing here. <clears throat> By the way, there's a little lesson here, too. It is very easy as a jammer referee to let your guard down right around the time the whistle starts, because you expect your jammers to move forward, because that's what they almost always do. But not always. This one? Boom, she went right into her jam start. So if you're not watching carefully... You can miss the, uh, miss that block, or actually suddenly be like, "Whoa, did she move her feet or not? I wasn't looking at her feet." So be ready for that. Anytime you see your jammer lining up really close to another jammer, because there's a good chance that hit's going to go in. Let's try another stop block. Let's see. 
There we go. Okay, derby direction. This is an outside pack referee's view, so derby direction is to the right. So let's see what happens. Go to the screen jammer. Screen jammer is being impeded. She can't get through. Remember, it's perfectly legal to, you know, have like an initial little stop block. See, like there, boom. She's black or, or brown. There has come to a stop. She's not moving, but she must immediately resume counterclockwise movement or cease the block. And she does not. Instead. She kind of moves her skate in a little bit there. That's fine, even if you want to call that counterclockwise movement, I suppose. But I'm sorry, dirt like perpendicular movement. But then she's just lingering right there. So, and finally, she's a the, you know blocker is able to kind of get through by going that way. And I don't even want to know, by the way, what kind of multiplayer block is going on there. There look, clearly looks like there's something going on there. I'd say there's some grasping in there. So. Let's see. Uh... All right. Uh, let's see. And we've got number 14. Let's take a look at another one here. <laughs> Woo. Okay, let me go back here. <laughs> and he engages. <laughs> makes no progress. Black blocker, stop block. I can't read your number. Outside. Black 1-8, stop block. All right. Now, two things here. First, see green blockers trying to get through. Green blocker initiates. Okay, fine. They're moving. They're moving. But then look what happens. That outside blocker, she is moving. I mean, look, look, look how far forward she's moving here. She's going, 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 going. And she's dug her that wheel in, and now she's stopped. Well, I'm sorry. Because that, if, look, well, yes, yeah, she's stopped. But also, look, the jammer has stopped initiating for a moment. Then the jammer re-engages, and she just digs that wheel in, and nada. She ain't moving. So there's a penalty in there. Now, I can't read her number. I haven't, don't think you can either from this angle. This is not a great angle to call a penalty. So what do I do? I try to indicate and describe who the blocker is, in part because I want to get that outside pack referee's attention to help get her off the track, because that way he can, uh, that way that referee can step in and try to go after it. So let's take a look at this again. Okay, comes to stop, disengages, goes back in. There's the stop block. There's Black blocker, stop block. I can't read your number. Outside. Black 1-8, stop block. There we go. So I managed to get that blocker's attention. It took me a moment, but I got it and got the blocker off the track. And that was a good call. I was pleased by that one. All right. What do we got here? We have a, yes, out-of-bounds block. This one's going to be a penalty. Let's take a look. Okay. No pack! Pack! All right. Now, I'm lucky that my front IPR got that because now look what happens here. We've got a pack. They engage. They go back. The, there's a no pack situation now. And they come forward and it reforms. But now let's take a look at out of the corner of our view. It's really not very good. And what is black one doing? Black one has gotten forced out of bounds. See, there, there's her skate on the other side. I look back a second because i got to make sure they're reforming. I look back, and black one is now engaging. She's pushing in from out of bounds. She's initiating a block. And what happens? She gets in. Now, cut aside. That is an out of bounds block because black one has regained position on the track. She has no position. She's out of bounds. She got, she's got nothing right now. Boom, she's forced out of bounds, and she pushes her way back in successfully. Now, head, again, cut aside on this, head that blue blocker that initiated the hit, just moved away on her own, and then black one stepped in, well, then that would not have been an out-of-bounds block. But that, that blocker is still trying to keep her from coming in, and she manages to successfully get back in. She basically forced her way back on the track. So again, we'll take a look at it and see how it, how it looks. No pack! Pack! There we go. She forced her way back in, and that's the penalty. All right, let's take a look at this one. No sound on this one, so. All right. 
Now take a look at this. Watch that jammer, because it's the same sort of thing. She's going to get forced out of bounds. She's out of bounds. She's kind of backing up. And look, she initiates a block, pushes that black blocker back slightly. It's well, not the greatest angle here, but she's forced out of bounds. Look how there's all, all that blocking and contact. So she steps back, and look what happens. She initiates a block forward. I think there might even, I don't I can't tell if that's a forearm or a chicken wing, but either way, she's pushed that black blocker back, and she regained a position on the track. Now, she's in back of black blocker, so there's no danger of any cut here, but it doesn't matter. She's got no position on the track, and just because you want to get on the track does not mean you have some sort of right of way, or you can push people out of your way to get back on the track. There was black blocker was in her way, she initiated a block to make room, and then she took advantage of that room and stepped back on the track. That warrants a penalty. All right. Now, this one, interesting call here. Yes, ah, loud in my ear. I will never learn. Okay. Yes, All right. What exactly is going on here? And boom, swishes that one right back down. So let's take a look here, folks. First off, we got the jammer. Okay, I'm sorry, we got a, yeah, black black jammer falls. Now we've got a is that a j is that the other jammer? I'm not sure even who that is. I think that's a blocker. Yeah, I can't exactly tell. Yeah, that's a blocker with a red helmet. Trying to get around the down jammer, fails. She puts her hand on her and smushes her back down to the floor. Look how she's kind of like getting up a little bit and boom, just crunches her right back down. And then she falls herself, but that's her own problem. Okay, so let's take a look. We're going to have to unparse this a couple of times. First, who's the initiator in all this? Let's take a look here. There goes the blocker. She didn't make it. So the blocker put her hand on her back and smushed her back down. Now that would be blocking a down skater, except, again, let's take a look. Look at look at Black Blocker. Now I want you to ask yourself right now, what is Black Blocker's obligation? She's a downed skater in the middle of the pack with action flailing around her. She has one obligation at this point. That is to fall small. She's not small though. I mean, she look, look at her, like her butt's up and she's got like one arm fully extended. And okay, maybe that's the way she landed. So let's see if she adapts a fall small position. No, look at what her right leg is doing. It's in, and it's pushing out all the way, and she's lifting her, she's trying to lift herself up. She's trying to get back up. She's not falling small. She's instantly trying to recover. So she moves her right leg out, and as she moves her right leg out, the balance on her left leg shifts, and look what happens with her left skate. See, it's tilted up. It's tilting sideways. And that may be partially what caused the contact, but either way, she has an obligation to fall small and minimize her real estate, and she's not. She's increasing it and trying to get back up. So I'm going to rule that she's actually initiating the low block in here because red blocker is trying to make a good faith effort on getting around her and those skates clip. And if black blocker had, you know, gone in and fall small, maybe she could have tucked it in more. Certainly it wouldn't have been tilting more in her way and that might have prevented it. So I'm thinking black blocker is actually initiating causing red blocker to fall. Now, red blocker certainly does smush her in the back, you know, like put her hand on her back. She's trying to kind of brace herself there as she falls. And while, yes, on one hand, I'm not certainly thrilled with, you know, you know, putting your hand on a blocker and smushing her down when you're falling on her. The other choice, imagine if she didn't. Well, then she's going to basically, if she, she purposely didn't hold her arm back and she can't brace herself, now she's going to fall with all of her weight on that skater. And I don't think that would have been any better at all. I think that would have actually been worse. So I'm thinking Black Jammer is the initiator, and that's what caused uh, a red uh, blocker to fall. But I'm also conceding this is, an, this is like a Rorschach inkblot, where different officials can look at this and see different things. And I also have the advantage of parsing this on a frame-by-frame -frame basis on my computer at home, where I can watch it 20 times. Officials during a game have one shot at it you know, in real time, and they got to get it right, and it's very difficult to do. 
I think this jammer, or I'm sorry, this referee, and I'm not certain, called it as blocking a down skater. Going over the footage, that's not how I would do it. That's not what I'm ruling, but eh, I'm not doing it in real time. So it's a lot harder to get it right. So, all right, one final penalty. It's another ink blot penalty where different referees are going to see different things. This one, though, about blocking while airborne. And this time I'm remembering to turn the sound down a bit. All right, let's take a look. Red 4-4, four, four, leaping contact. All right, was this leaping contact? Now let's watch it at half speed, folks. Boom, jumps, nails are in the leg. Okay, let's take a look. Here we go. Here comes, by the way, thank you, referee, for not standing in my way, although you're supposed to have a name on the back of your uniform. So remember, that is required under a regulation game. A referee must have an identifying name or number or at least something on their back of the uniform so they can be uniquely identified. Anyway, here comes Red Jammer. And Red Jammer is jumping and hits her in the leg. But, and so, yes, that would certainly be a leaping contact because she forced her out of bounds. Let's take one more look. Look where the blocker is. That blocker is, eh, you know, there's some room in there. But the blocker is, again, how far is that? Two and a half feet, three feet, maybe let's say three feet. And then she's moving to the outside. That's not three feet anymore. That's now about six inches. So that blocker has initiated. Keep in mind that, well, yes, yeah, certainly that red jammer is a little ways back and she'd be able to plow stop. Now, first thing, you have to take the skill of the skaters into account. I'm going to expect a Victorian jammer, who is one of the best jammers in the world, to be able to instantly judge that this is not going to make a, be a successful jump and be able to plow stop in that, you know, shift into a plow stop very fast. But I'm not expecting nowhere roller derby, and I'm not saying that's what these people are, but I wouldn't expect a very low-end league to be able to make that same reaction time. They're not going to be as skilled skaters. I have no idea who these teams are, but I'm thinking, eh, you know, kind of low, mid-skill, something. It doesn't matter. Point being is, you know, this blocker is getting in the way. And I don't. I think this jammer is kind of making her choice about right here, and she's still got some room at this point. So she's accelerating, going in for it. And right now, if she sees that blocker now getting in her way, what's that red jammer supposed to do? You know, she's in the middle of a stride. By the time she, you know, solves it, she's got no time to plow stop. So what happens? She jumps, but black blocker has initiated by getting in her way. And down she goes. So I'm thinking, actually, I'm thinking, uh, you know, black blocker, while she's moving a tiny bit clockwise, that clockwise action is not what contributed to that... Uh, uh, to the hit. I'm thinking actually it's a legal block on Black Blocker's part resulting in Red Jammer falling down and Black Blocker going out of bounds. I would say no call on this. But I will concede that different referees may look at this and see something different. Red 4-4 four, four, leaping contact. There you go. And by the way, a couple of things. First, thanks to General Hel Helativity for making his library available to me once again. It's got such wonderful footage. A lot of the stuff's mine, but a lot of it's his. Second, I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here. I am studying video clips by looking them in slow motion, frame by frame, over and over. That's way easier to make calls and judge a situation than it is in real time. So... I do not want to sound like I'm criticizing the referees in question here because they're doing the best they can uh, when it's when the game is live and they're under pressure, and I'm not. So, you know, again, don't take me as criticizing them. But with that, that concludes Lesson 20A on Illegal Contact. And we will be back in Lesson 20B, Multiplayer Blocks. Thanks.